Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Fukui Raptor and some dinosaur news, as well as our review of Lego Jurassic World. First in the news... There's an article that was published in the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society titled A New Basal Sauropodiform from South Africa and the Phylogenetic Relationships of Basal Sauropodomorphs. And specifically, they're talking about Cephaponosaurus. The article was written by Alejandro Otero, as well as others from Argentina and the location where the bones were stored, which is South Africa's University of Witwatersrand. The website Everything Dinosaur indicated the fossils were previously thought to be an Aerodonyx celeste, which was described about six years ago. And the Aerodonyx has helped scientists to discover how a two-legged dinosaur could transition into a four-legged dinosaur. And it looks like this new fossil will add some detail to that picture. So the bones sat in South Africa's University of Witwatersrand for about 80 years after they were excavated. And now they finally gave it a name, Cephaponosaurus. It comes from the Sesotho word Cephapano, which means cross. At first I thought that was a reference to it representing a transition fossil, like I mentioned, but it's actually in reference to the ankle bone, also known as an astragalus, and in this case it's shaped like a cross. The full name is Cephaponosaurus zastronensis, and the fossil was discovered in the Zastron town in South Africa, so that's where the species name comes from. So Cephaponosaurus is closely related to sauropods, but also massospondylus, which is helping the authors in, quote, increasing the currently known diversity of the so-called transitional forms leading to sauropoda, end quote. So if you haven't seen a massospondylus or an aerodonyx before, they have much shorter forelimbs than hindlimbs and are a lot smaller than a sauropod, but they still have a lot of similarities, and you could kind of see how one would evolve into the other. We're going to have to do an episode on them sometime to talk about this. Because Cephaponosaurus looks like a transition between the two groups, they are calling it a medium-sized basal sauropodomorph, with basal meaning early in the evolutionary path. So the scientists recovered quite a few bones. They have forelimb and hindlimb bones, and since in this case there's a distinction between the arms and the legs, that's pretty important. They also had a lot of vertebrae from the back and the tail and some other miscellaneous bones, but unfortunately they didn't have a head and a couple other bones that you'd like to see. The bones that they did have gave them a good indication of what it probably looked like, and along with other recent sauropodomorph discoveries, it's helping to clear up the evolution of sauropods, which I think is really fascinating because it shows how an arm can evolve into a leg, and then all the changes that go along with that as well as the huge increase in size that sauropods eventually went through. Paleontologists from the University of Bonn, which is in Germany, recently made a digital 3D model of a discovery site using photos. Twelve years ago, a private fossil collector discovered 20 dinosaur footprints in a quarry near Goslar, Germany, and in that area, during the late Jurassic around 154 million years ago, there was a shallow sea and a lot of small islands and small well, relatively small dinosaurs living there. One example is the Eurapasaurus, which was about 6 to 8 meters in length, and to give you an idea of why this is considered small, it's about a quarter the length of its closest relative, which is the Camarasaurus. And the reason for its size is probably due to not having as much food available. So this new 3D model shows that theropods, actually most likely two different types of theropods, and the largest one was 8 meters long, probably migrated to the area about 35,000 years later, possibly because the sea level had dropped, and they came probably to hunt Europasaurus, again, a relatively small sauropod, so probably a lot of good meat. And according to the digital model, this area was only dry temporarily, so just long enough for them to migrate over and hunt the sauropods. And if you want to know more about this, the findings were published in Paleontologia Electronica, and interestingly, one of the authors said that this model wouldn't have been possible to make even five years ago, so it's interesting 
how in such a short amount of time we can learn so much using new technology. Australia's Science Channel published an interesting video, and we'll post this in our notes later in the week. It's basically talking about how we know a lot more about dinosaurs today, but the media, such as Jurassic World, doesn't necessarily portray it. And they talk about how since 1996, 40 species of feathered dinosaurs have been found, and the line between birds and dinosaurs are really blurring together now. Many dinosaurs probably had feathers that looked the same as modern birds, and in the video they compared Archaeopteryx with a small carnivorous dinosaur, at least the skeletons of it, and you can see how similar they look. To an untrained eye, it would be very hard to tell apart. Yeah, they actually compared Archaeopteryx to Compsognathus, and at first, when you look at the two fossils, it doesn't look that similar, probably because we're not paleontologists, but <laughs> when you highlight the head and the neck and the arms and the legs and everything, you really see all of the similarities, other than the lack of wings, obviously. But the way all the bones line up, the number of vertebrae, everything really looks very similar. And the overall size of them is pretty similar, too. Yeah. Well, I'd argue that because we're not paleontologists, we might think they're the same, not so different. They look really similar to me. Other than that, wings. Well, other than the wings, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> later on, we're going to talk about Lego Jurassic World, where they call them compies. <laughs> yeah. To throw That's that nice. Co- I mean, it's less of a mouthful. Yeah, because that Nathus part, or Ganathus, always throws... Anyway, the video also talked a bit about feathers, dinosaur feathers. So apparently dinosaurs had a wider variety of feathers than modern birds. They had a lot of fluffy down for insulation, and the secondary function for feathers was also for display purposes, not for flight. It actually, for the first hundred million years, feathers were not used for flight. The video is only about eight and a half minutes long, so it's worth watching. Sabrina mentioned a, a private fossil collector earlier. And I saw a post that said you could own your own Velociraptor claw for $12,500, which sounds very exciting and a lot cheaper than you'd expect it to be. (laughs) So, of course, I had to look into it. It's for sale on the Astro Gallery of Gems, and their tagline is The World of Natural History. So they have this for sale, and it says it's from Mongolia, China, which is weird because Mongolia is not in China. But there is a province called Inner Mongolia in China, so maybe that's where it's from, or maybe it's from Mongolia. They just think Mongolia is part of China. I don't know. I guess if you're into natural history, maybe you don't pay too much attention to the boundaries of countries. Anyway, I was surprised that it was $12,500, like I mentioned, but as soon as I saw it, I realized why. So it is, I guess, technically a velociraptor claw, But it's not the claw you think of when you hear Velociraptor claw. It's more like a Velociraptor toe. And since dinosaurs and birds don't really have toes, they have claws. All of their toes are claws. But it's not the dew claw, the big curved, exciting one. It's just a regular toe, basically. And then $12,500 sounds kind of like a lot for a toe. (laughs) They also have a juvenile Edmontosaurus foot from the Lake Creek Formation in Montana in the U.S. I guess they're a lot more familiar with geography in the U.S. than they are with China. And that one costs $18,000, so that's a little more like what I would expect. And then they have a couple of Diplodocus foot bones from the Morrison Formation in Wyoming in the U.S., and those are about two grand each. So if you're into that kind of thing, maybe you should look at them. I still don't really know the whole debate about whether private people should be buying bones or if they should all be in museums, but it is what it is. The New Yorker, in its humor section, posted a pretty funny short piece called The Rejected Hybrid Dinosaurs of Jurassic World, and I just want to highlight a few of them. It's pretty entertaining. There's Robo-Rex, which is half robot, half T-Rex, and he's got a machine gun tail but also the tiny arms of a T-Rex. There is Todd Rex, who has the body of a T-Rex, but the head of the writer's brother-in-law, Todd. So he's nice, but he's kind of boring. Except now, with the dinosaur body, he's not as boring. There is uh, Tyrannosaurus Mex, which is a T-Rex that eats Mexican food, but he's not a Mexican dinosaur, and he does not like burritos. 
There's also Tyrannosaurus rex 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 rex. There's actually a number of these, Tyrannosaurus rex rex and Tyrannosaurus rex rex rex. But the four T-Rexes, it's basically how it sounds, four T-Rexes stacked on top of each other. (laughs) And then there's also Duck Rex, which is half duck, half T-Rex, and according to the author, quote, this one isn't very good. (laughs) (laughs) Do they have pictures of all of them? No, they don't. It's just They're just making them up. Yeah. (laughs) That's funny. I'd like to see an interpretation of four T-Rexes stacked on top of each other. (laughs) The Washington Post shared, actually, it's all over the internet, hashtag Pratt Keeping, which I can't believe I didn't notice this before I read the Washington Post article. But to give some background, and in our blog, we'll post a link to this article so you can see the video. It's a short video. Basically, hashtag Pratt Keeping revolves around the scene in Jurassic World where Chris Pratt is in the cage with the quote-unquote velociraptors, and he is trying to get out safely, so he is holding out his arms and telling them, like, don't even think about it, just stay where you are, and then backing away slowly out of the cage. That has sparked a hashtag called Pratt Keeping. It started off with a bunch of zoologists taking pictures of themselves in the same position with whatever animals <laughs> that they are in charge of. So there's giraffes. I think there might have been seen flamingos. Or like yaks. Yaks. A lot of like large, slow, unimposing animals. <laughs> And then people started doing it with non-animals. Like yeah. we saw boats. <laughs> In like a museum, there's some boats. Museum boats. Somebody put together Lego pieces of Chris Pratt's character Owen Grady with three Velociraptor <laughs> Legos. Things like that. But according to the Washington Post, the ultimate meme is an image of an actual paleontologist or an actual dinosaur curator from the smithsonian natural museum of history doing that pose with three mounted fossils and i think one of them was actually like a terror bird or a moa bird or something and not a dinosaur but i guess that maybe they're related to dinosaurs i don't know but yeah we'll post a link in our blog but also if you just search on twitter hashtag pratt keeping i'm sure you'll see some amazing images next up we have some games to talk about starting with a diehard game on kickstarter which we actually mentioned in our last episode but since they're a kickstarter campaign i thought it was worth mentioning again they've got by the time this episode airs probably about five days to go They've had about $48,000 already pledged of its $25,000 goal, so that's good news. The project will definitely be funded by more than 500 backers, which is great. And the Kickstarter project is Apex, a theropod deck building game, specifically an expansion pack. So this deck building game is for one to six players and you play as a prehistoric predator. And this Stomping Grounds expansion pack includes three new predators, including Megalodon, Sauropheganax, and Therozenosaurus. Yeah, I think it's pretty funny that he picked two fairly obscure and very specific theropod dinosaurs and then an ancient shark (laughs) to go with it. (laughs) But he said there were a lot of people who requested it, so I think that's why it made the cut. Yeah, and thank you, Ray, who emailed us to let us know about this Kickstarter. Next up in games, there is Wreck and Roar, a dinosaur game, which is a new game by Hasbro where the players play as T-Rexes and they chomp at each other as well as people made out of Play-Doh, which sounds pretty fun. So from Gizmodo, who reported on it, quote, In Jurassic Park, its sequels in Jurassic World, there are plenty of people being eaten by dinosaurs, but the toys released alongside those Jurassic movies usually tiptoe around that ugly reality, except for Play-Doh, who wholeheartedly encourages kids to make tiny, plasticine people destined to be dino dinner. Awesome. So speaking of playing as a dinosaur, Sabrina and I finished Lego Jurassic World, and we have quite a bit to say about it. I think this has the potential to be the best Lego game, in terms of being able to smash and the storyline and everything, except that it is so glitchy. Yeah, so we played it on Steam, which is the PC version of the game. It's gotten pretty popular. I mean, they sell a lot of PC game versions of it, but it's also released on Xbox and PlayStation and half a million other things. So if you're playing it on a different system, you might not have the issues that we had, but we had a ton of issues. (laughs) 
even from starting the game, sometimes it wouldn't start and you'd have to restart it over and over and over again and eventually it would get going, like trying to start a 50-year-old car, <laughs> except it's a game that you just bought that's brand new. There was one glitch where the first time you get a Triceratops, I think we might have mentioned it, it glitched and it was permanently running in one direction and you couldn't do anything about it, so you had to exit the level and start all over again. Yeah, sometimes you'd be in the middle of a level and for whatever reason the character would just fall out of the game yeah, like if you've ever played a game where you fall through the map and you're in like that weird empty matrix world where it's just black floor, white sky, and you're just falling perpetually, and then you got to exit again, and that's super frustrating. Start all over, and then it didn't always save. Yeah, it didn't always save either. Apparently people have had issues with corrupt save games, which would be kind of heartbreaking mm -hmm. <laughs> to have to start all over again. There was one time we were in a battle between two of the dinosaurs, and we kept doing the same button combo and it would do its little attack and then it would just do it again and again and again and after about 10 of them we thought i think something went wrong here <laughs> so we exited and got back in and then finally it, there was an extra button that wasn't showing up for some reason and then we could finish it but when it is working well and we play as the dinosaurs it's awesome yeah it was great it had a lot of really good dialogue. The first movie, so it goes through all four movies, and you can do them sequ You have to do the Jurassic Park series sequentially, but you could do Jurassic World earlier if you wanted to. But the original Jurassic Park used all the dialogue, just cut clips from the original movie. And I think because they did it that way, it was a little bit echoey and not as clear as some of the other dialogue. The fourth movie, the Jurassic World actually had original dialogue recorded by Chris Pratt and some of the others so it fit perfectly where they would say like oh what's going on with that pipe or whatever rather than just clips so that was probably the best put together one and then of course they had the iconic scenes and then typical lego humor so none of the characters die in the games they just get swallowed up and spit out or they're living in a creature's stomach for a while or something and i think one of my favorites is um i forget the character's name where in the first movie in Jurassic Park, and it, he is fending off the raptors, and he's got that line that says, clever girl. <laughs> yeah. And in the game, it's because the raptor has filled his gun with a banana and then pops up out of the bushes with a bunch of fruit on its head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. I also liked um, the scene where they're going to turn the power back on in the basement or in like some shed somewhere, and Dr. Ellie goes and switches the power, and then she feels an arm on her shoulder, and she's all relieved. And in the movie, it's just an arm. The rest of the body is missing. But in the Lego version, it's a asleep version of him. <laughs> of Samuel L. Jackson's yeah. character. Yeah, and he just kind of falls over rather than, you know, having a disattached arm, which is <laughs> kind of funny seeing how they piece together some of, like, the horror genre and make it just kind of funny. The dinosaurs in the game are awesome. And when you play through the regular game, you get to play as quite a few of them, like an Ankylosaurus. Triceratops. Pachycephalosaurus. T-Rex. Quote-unquote Velociraptor. Compies. <laughs> yeah, compies. <laughs> but when you really get to play as them is in the free play. So when you go through the levels, you find little pieces of amber with a mosquito in it, and that allows you to play as the dinosaur when you leave the level. And Sabrina's favorite, of course, is the sauropods. Well, sort of. One quick thing is a couple of these dinosaurs also come with baby versions of the dinosaurs. So there's <laughs> baby Triceratops, baby T-Rex, baby Velociraptor, which is adorable and just hops around. <laughs> so the one sauropod, we haven't gotten all of the dinosaurs yet. We've beaten all the levels, but we're still working through the free play stuff. And Brachiosaurus is an amazing dinosaur. It's huge when you're playing it. The little Lego people look so tiny. Um, mm -hmm. You can smash anything so easily but it walks very slowly <laughs> as i'm sure it did in real life so it's score one for realism but in a game <laughs> can get very frustrating very quickly so i would like to see a baby version of the brachiosaurus maybe that would go a little bit faster <laughs> yeah and it would be cuter also mm -hmm. the baby t-rex is adorable because it kind of hops from one leg to the other so it looks <laughs> when you're doing it you can't help but go like bum ba dum ba dum <laughs> 
You can also unlock some of the pterosaurs. We haven't gotten any of them yet. And I think the mosasaur from Jurassic World as well. The story is interesting. So it's broken up into five individual levels for each game. So it's a total of 20 levels. And they did a really good job of condensing an entire movie basically into five scenes, more or less. Sometimes they would kind of take a jump in the middle of it, but it was never really jarring, with a possible exception in Jurassic World, but I don't want to throw any spoilers in this episode, so I won't go into any detail. But they did a really good job, and it was fun to see how they kind of combined certain plot lines so that it kind of connected up and everything. Overall, it was a really fun game. They have all the characters and all of the recent LEGO games. Individual characters have special abilities, and in this one they added a feature where when you're switching characters it tells you what all their abilities are which was one of the frustrations of earlier Lego games where you would try to remember, like, who has that wrench? And you would, like, switch through a bunch of characters or Google it or whatever. In this one, you could, when you're in the character selection, it tells you right there. Oh, and there's a lot of really cool vehicles so you can use that gyrosphere from Jurassic World or the motorcycle. They have the original Jeep from the movie as well as the one that follows the rails that gets smashed in by the T-Rex. Lots of cool cars and stuff. So overall, I think... As a dinosaur enthusiast, it's a great game. As a polished game, at least on computer, is pretty. <laughs> it could use some improvement, but true. But like all Lego games, you get a lot of joy out of smashing everything. Yeah, and another a reason Sabrina and I play so many of these games is there aren't that many good games for two people to play in the same room. Most of them are either focused on online or single player, and this one is a really good co-op two-player game. So. If you're looking for a good two-player game, it's a good choice. That's all we've got for dinosaur news, and on to our dinosaur of the day, Fuqui Raptor, whose name means Fuqui Thief. And Fuqui Raptor was named in 2000 by Dr. Philip Curry from the University of Alberta and Yochi Azuma from the Fuqui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum in Japan. The type species is Fuqui Raptor kitadaniensis, and the type species, interestingly, was possibly a juvenile. It was only about 4.2 meters long, 14 feet, and 2 meters or 6 feet 6 tall. It was found in Japan, and it lived in the Cretaceous. And it's a carnosaur, like Allosaurus, but at first, Fuqui raptor was thought to be a raptor because when it was found, one of its large claws on its hand was thought to be the killing claw or the dew claw on its toe, which is similar to other dromaeosaurs, but eventually scientists determined that the claw belonged on its hand. Now, even though scientists first thought the type specimen was a juvenile, they think it actually may have been an adult since other specimens have since been found in the same area and they have found some juveniles that were a lot smaller. The theory is that Fuqui raptor may have been small or or at least small at a young age, and would have grown much bigger over the years, like tyrannosaurids. Now, there's actually one analysis that found it may be a tyrannosaurid. Officially, Fuqui raptor is the most complete and only theropod found in Japan, and the holotype is a partial skeleton. It's jaw fragments, teeth, vertebrae, bones from the arms and hind limbs. And in 2000, in the paper by Dr. Philip Curry and Azuma, they described Fuqui raptor as having narrow blade-like cheek teeth based on its maxillary crown. Some of the teeth had blood grooves, which were found on Fuqui raptor teeth, but not other theropod teeth from the Kitadani quarry where it was found. Its teeth were similar to other carnosaurs and had small serrations. And compared to herbivore fossils in the Kitadani quarry, Fuqui raptor bones were pretty common. There are actually more theropods in the quarry, which is rare, and there may have been, quote, some unusual circumstances involved in the genesis of the site, according to the paper. So, for example, because so many juvenile Fuqui raptors were found, it may have been near a nesting site. There's a couple examples of quarries with more carnivore than herbivore bones, such as the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry, which has more than 70 Allosaurus individuals and may have been a predator trap. Other sites with lots of carnivores were due to drought, they all died at once, or raised the possibility that carnivores may have hunted in packs which is a theory by Dr. Philip Curry, and he talks about that in our interview with him in an earlier episode. But it's not clear why there were so many theropods in the Kitadani quarry. If you want to see Fuku Raptor, you can see an animatronic version in the Fukui Prefectural Dinosaur Museum in Japan, along with 10 other animatronic dinosaurs. Apparently, the animatronic Fuku Raptor blinks and moves its head as well as poses threateningly. 
I've seen some of those, uh, some videos of the animatronic dinosaurs in that museum, and they look awesome. So I really want to go there. It, it shouldn't be surprising since Japan is always very advanced in terms of robotics, but that looks like a really good dinosaur museum. Yeah, and the museum is pretty new. It opened in 2000, the same year Fukui Raptor was named, and admission is 1,200 yen. I had to check just to see how much that is in U.S. dollars. It's about $10, so don't get scared away by that price. It's one of the largest dinosaur museums in Japan, and it's located in Katsuyama City, Fukui Prefecture. It's the center of dinosaur research in Japan. The museum has four floors, and of course it's near the Kitadani Quarry, which is a large excavation site, possibly one of the largest dinosaur quarries in the world. And this excavation site has bones, eggshells, and footprints. It's a little bit complicated how Fukui Raptor is grouped. So it is a Megaraptorin Neovenatorid Allosaurid, although there are some who say Megaraptorins may be Tyrannosaurid. But Fernando Novas and his colleagues in 2012 grouped Megaraptora in a paper in studies as part of Neovenatoridae, which makes Neovenatorids one of the last types of allosaurids. At least one of them, Orgoraptor, lived at the end of the Cretaceous. Megaraptora is a group of large theropods. They're part of a large group of carnosaurs that includes allosaurids, metriacanthosaurids, and carcharodontosaurids. Neovenatoridae is a family that represents a branch of allosaurids and and they had short, wide shoulder blades and a lot of cavities in their upper hip bones. And our fun fact of the day, again, relates to eggs. It's kind of becoming a trend here. It is estimated that trillions of dinosaur eggs were laid during the Mesozoic era. And despite that huge number, fossilized eggs that contain embryos are still very rare. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. For those waiting for your ebooks, we will be sending them out soon, except for Dinosaur Wars, which won't be published until later this month. Thank you again for your continuing patience. And also thanks for listening. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.